All right. So, Matt, the other day, Ashley sent me this like really romantic text. And she said, if you're sleeping, send me your dreams. If you're laughing, send me a smile. If you're crying, send me a tear. And I replied, uh, I'm in the bathroom. Please advise. <laughs> Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the graveyard. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Adam, and my name's Matt. Now. Pull up a tombstone or settle into your casket and get comfortable because this is Graveyard Tales. (laughs) All right, everybody. Here we are again. Matt, how you doing tonight, brother? Man, I'm good. 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 Glad to be here. Oh, yeah. So ready to ready to roll. Speaking of being here, Matt, um, I, I thought this was interesting. I'm going through and editing some of our old episodes to make them YouTube episodes, right? So we can put them up on YouTube for everybody. Go Mm -hmm. check out Graveyard Tales on YouTube if you have not, and you can get some of our back episodes. Um, But our sound has so dramatically changed from the beginning till now. And I noticed that we have like three different periods like like graveyard tales period we've got the baroque period where we were baroque and had no <laughs> equipment right uh but you know it, it's funny just I, I was reminiscing the other day and thinking about wow we what a ways we've come sound wise and and you know the production value that's put into the show and it's all because of you listeners that help us out that support the show whether through patreon or or buying our sponsors you know buying from our sponsors that helps us out tremendously um so you know and speaking of sponsors tonight this episode is sponsored by manscaped which is a new sponsor to graveyard tales that we're really excited about we'll talk more about them later and also care of a sponsor that's been with us for quite a while so if you're interested please go use the graveyard tales code on either of those and that lets them know that you heard about them from us and it helps us out tremendously it helps them out because you're buying something from them but it helps matt and i out so much more because then they will come back and continue to advertise with us so please go do that right right yeah and we appreciate everybody doing that and all the support that you've shown uh, adam and myself Mm mm-hmm um, speaking of support, uh, please go check out the Podbelly Network at podbelly.com. You can find different ways to record your own podcast, you know, different tricks and tips. Um, and you can also find different shows to listen to if you're still, you know, not going out places because of lockdowns and all that and you need more shows. Go check out podbelly.com and you can find you some different shows to listen to. Um, also, please go rate and review us on iTunes or wherever you listen to it, that helps us out tremendously too. Matt, we got to tell everybody, we still need some stories for the Christmas episode. It's drawing near. Yeah. We yeah, got right. just a little over a month when this episode drops, and we're going to need all of your paranormal stories that you've got. If you know people who have some, send them in to us. You can send them to Graveyard Tales Podcast at gmail.com or... Go to the website and drop us a note from the website. Yeah, and, you know, you guys have done such a fantastic job over the last few years. Um, we we just, we expect that you'll you'll do it again. And, you know, even though it, it's, it, it's, it's still, you know, weeks away, uh, it, it does take us a little bit of time to get these stories, you know, vetted and, and set up in a format where Adam mm-hmm. and I can read them. Um, so, you know, give us a little bit of time. If you've been sitting on one and you think, ah, it's too early, you know, clean it up and send it on. Yeah, it's never um, too early. Yeah. I mean, we, we want them. Uh, so send them on to us. And um, we're really looking forward to a great Christmas show again this year. 
Yep, absolutely. Um, so stick around at the end of the show when we finish the show. Uh, we've got some voicemails from some listeners that we're going to drop at the end. Um, so if you've sent us a voicemail, then uh, listen to it. You know, check out right there at the end um, after the episode, and you might hear yourself on this episode. So yeah, we, Matt, I think that's all the bovine scatology I've got. <laughs> That's all the chit chat. Yep. So, why don't you tell us what are we talking about tonight, brother? Well, you know, when Adam and I discuss locations that have paranormal activity, we see a lot of common themes. I mean, for example, how many haunted hospitals have we discussed? A, a lot. You know how? Uh, uh, nowhere near all of them, uh, but a lot of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, haunted prisons. We've talked about a few of those. Uh, We've discussed uh, a couple of places that are like where we're going to talk about tonight, like uh, Aoki Gahara and the Rendlesham Mm -hmm. forest tend to hold this feeling of mystery and whether it's just, it's the darkness from the shade of the trees or the fear of getting lost or ideas of what kind of terrifying creatures could be hiding out there. When you're standing deep within a forest, sometimes you feel like you're visiting some distant planet. Yep. Tonight, we're going to discuss another forest, but this is not just some scary grove of trees. This forest has been nicknamed the Bermuda Triangle of Romania, and that's thanks to the just the myriad of strange occurrences associated with it. So, Adam and I are going to take a deep hike into the Hoya Bachu Forest. Yes, we are. And this episode was actually uh, picked by our patrons over on Patreon. Um, right. So if you picked this one, here you go. Uh, we're, we're about to do it for you. And if you would like to do that at some point, pick another episode topic, go become a patron, yeah. and we'll throw up the thing, and you can pick one we do. And if you hate this episode, it's your own daggum fault. Exactly. Blame (laughs) you. (laughs) I'm kidding. (laughs) Kind of. (laughs) Uh, But yeah, this place is uh, is kind of weird. And uh, you know, until until we had somebody uh, bring it up in the group one day, I honestly had never heard of it. Which I thought was weird because as as many places as you and I have heard of, mm-hmm. for for something to float across my desk and I'm like I've never heard of this. It's it's pretty rare. I may not know a lot, but I, you know most of the time I've at least heard of it, and I had not right. heard of this place. And you know honestly, the only reason I'd ever heard of this is I I watched a documentary several years ago and they mentioned it. So. It's not like I knew everything about it either. I just had heard the name and kind of knew what like the deal was with it. But I didn't I didn't know, you know, at all everything that we're going to talk about tonight. So why don't we go ahead and get into it? Um, Like we always say, go down to the bottom of our show notes. You can check out all our sources. You can go follow along with where we're reading from the sources. um, And then you can, you know take a deeper dive into some of the things that we may not have covered in this episode. But like Matt said, the Hoya Bachu forest is known as the world's most haunted forest. And it's situated near Cluj, Napoca, Romania. Um, and it's often referred to like Matt said, as the Bermuda triangle of Romania. So before we get into the forest, let's take a quick look at the Cluj, Napoca real quick. And this comes from culturetrip.com. And it says the Napoca of Cluj Napoca, and I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. I'm sorry. I'm doing the best I can. Forgive me. Yeah. Um, At Napoca. Yeah. Napoca Cabana. That's terrible. No. (laughs) (laughs) Barely a man I know. (laughs) 
So the Napoca from Cluj Napoca was the name of the Roman citadel founded on the city's territory more than 2,000 years ago. Um, Romans had settled and built a citadel in what is today's city center. Um, in the first and second centuries, Napoca was the capital of the new Roman province and one of the most important cities in the eastern part of the Roman Empire. So it's been a, a happening place for a while. Um, Cluj is not called the heart of Transylvania because of its geographical position, but for its role in the historical and economical development of that region. During the 18th and early 19th centuries, when Transylvania was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Cluj was the capital of the empire's province, an unofficial title that the city holds in modern day today. So this says that if you are a medical student or just passionate about old remedies, there is a place that you can't miss, the Pharmacy Museum. Uh, sounds like a place I would like to go, Matt. Um, yeah, it sounds kind of cool. Yeah. A visit to Cluj's first pharmacy will introduce you to the 16th and 19th century medicine when mummy dust was one of the main cures for diseases. Mummy dust. Yeah, and I think I feel like we talked about that when we talked about the Pharaoh's curse or something like that. Um, we may not have, but... It used to be a thing where they believed that if you got a mummy and you ground it up into a powder and then took it, that it would cure ailments. So a hey, lot. Wait, 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 wait. If you got a mummy, uh huh. If you just happen to have one, what? Or yeah. or you roll up on one out yeah, on the I street. Mean, somebody hey, dumps grab, it. Grab that mummy. Yeah, somebody dumps <laughs> it in the dumpster behind the thing. But I mean, honestly, around that time, you know the. Uh, from the 16th to the 19th century, people were going through the tombs in Egypt and they were just taking mummies and shipping them back to the U.S., you know, and they'd ship them all over the world. So um, it, it wasn't like now you can't do that. You'll get arrested and thrown into Wait, prison yeah. for a long time. <laughs> they would just ship them out and people would take these mummies and they might save the head, but they didn't see the historical necessity to keep the mummy so they'd take the mummified flesh and grind it up into a powder and then mix it with water and drink it as a remedy for different things so yeah, yeah i can't imagine what it tasted like but that's that's can what you they imagine did. can you imagine look i'm stepping on your notes it says love potion yep hey baby <laughs> <laughs> you care for some mummy tea yeah right <laughs> and that's the thing, Matt, stepping on my notes, that you can learn how to prepare love potions uh, while you're there, too. So I don't know if that involved the mummy dust or not. <laughs> but it requires a mummy, you're probably out of luck. <laughs> well, and the thing is, I think if it's going to be a love potion made out of a mummy, there's one specific part that you're going to have to use of the mummy. <laughs> and I don't want that. <laughs> well, what's What's worse? What's worse than drinking a potion that's made from mummy dust? No, knowing what part of the mummy it was made from, that's yep, what's exactly, worse. <laughs> exactly. No, what is this tea? It tastes funny. Yep. Okay. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so before we fall down this hole of inappropriate jokes, uh, I'm going to keep going. <laughs> um. So Hoyabachu Forest has a reputation for intense paranormal activity, interdimensional portals, and unexplained events. It's been called the creepiest forest in the world. And Matt will talk about more of these a little bit later. They're, they're all kind of creepy, really. Oh, yeah. I mean, all forests, especially at night, are creepy. The Hoyabachu covers an area of about three square kilometers or 729 acres. Now, the forest was supposedly named after a shepherd that disappeared in the area with a flock of 200 sheep. So it, it means shepherd's forest. Um, but locals searched for him for days, but couldn't find any trace of him or his 200 sheep. So it's 729 vanished. acres and they just vanished. You yeah, know, I mean, it's kind of crazy. Um, well, maybe there's 300 wolves in there. Hey, there could be. There could be. <laughs> you know, I, 200 sheep, 300 wolves. You, you I, do the math. Yeah. 
I don't think so, but <laughs> there might be. Who knows with the Hoya Bachu, there could be anything. Um, this goes on to say that most people who live near the forest are actually afraid to enter it due to the stories and legends that have been handed down. They believe that those who visit the site will never return home. Many of the locals who have been brave enough to venture into the forest complained of physical harm, including rashes, nausea, vomiting, migraines, burns, scratches, anxiety, and other unusual sensations. That's a lot of crap to happen to you just going into the forest. I know. So it says um, that it is said that people feel as they are being watched as they are walking within this forest. Now, I'll be honest with you. I don't know that that's very, like that's a special feeling for Hoya Bachu. Because I've walked through many a forest and I always feel like something's watching me, whether it be yeah. animal. I don't normally feel like it's human watching me, but I always feel like I'm being watched by some animal and you probably are. Yeah, you know? as it'll say, you, that's a, there's a good chance that you're being watched by something. Yep, and it's a evolutionary advantage that we have. I think, again, I think we've talked about something like this before, but when we were talking about um, Thunderbirds, we have an inherent um, thing within humans that if we see a shadow that comes over us, we kind of freak out because mm -hmm. we were attacked, you know, years ago by large uh, carnivorous birds or you know tigers jumping out of trees at you or whatever so we're not top of the food chain when we go into forests and stuff like that so it, I think you just inherently feel like you're being watched and I think that can be said about all forests not just this one now this says that there have been reports of people hearing random giggling and female voices in the forest that is creepy yeah, I found that too. Um, random giggles, man. Random giggles. Never no a good thanks. thing. Ne no. Never a good thing. And, you know, even if you're a comedian, random giggles, also not a good thing. No. Um, but yeah, especially if you're out in the forest, that's not what you want to hear. Yeah, it's you, you're alone and then you hear just laughing or female voices talking. Not a good thing. Um, they also say that they have been scratched out of nowhere. So, oh, yeah. I mean, I've returned from a, a hike and had scratches that I don't necessarily remember getting, but, you know, you get hit by twigs and stuff, but I'm assuming mm -hmm. they're talking about something more than that. Yeah, surely. Now, they say that there, there's also history of people getting lost for days on end, not knowing or remembering that it had been any length of time at all, which that sounds like missing 411 to me. Mm-hmm. Um, people go missing and then just show back up later, not realizing they've been gone for five weeks and they think they just walked back out. That, that sounds like missing 411. Now, Hoya Bachu's uh, soil even holds archaeological evidence of a settlement dating back to Neolithic period believed to have been established around 6500 B.C., making it the oldest settlement from that time period to be found in Romania. So like we were talking before, it's it's been a hub of activity. Um, Cluj has been a hub of activity for a while. Well, apparently they have found old Romanian settlements in this forest, which is pretty cool. Yeah, and you know, age and history and, and whatnot would would lend itself to some increased activity. Sure. Um, you know, not, you know, not necessarily. I mean, you know, we're, we're talking about the planet here. Yeah. I mean, nature, I mean, just because this forest is old, doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, there's a, there's a newer forest somewhere else that it's not going to be haunted <laughs> because it's a lot newer. Right. You know, no, but you know, in, in settled areas, you know, the humans and animals bring about a different kind of energy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if it was a settled area, then there was quite possibly um, activity that had left a mark somewhere in the forest. Sure, sure. So the population of humans there is what would age this to the point where, I, you know, I would say 
okay, we're we're looking at an area that could potentially have a, a, enough history to have developed some paranormal activity or at least some you know some unexplained inner energy that uh that causes some of these situations and we're going to get we're going to get into that about what what you actually can see when you're in the forest that is not necessarily paranormal but it's strange right so the forest is described as bizarre in appearance and it's got these twisted and malformed trees and branches and the branches have been said to look as though they're reaching out to grab you as you're walking through and i'll post some pictures on patreon after this drops of these trees and some other stuff that we're going to talk about because they do have some really weird looking trees in yeah there. i know I, I don't it's, know what happened you know there's some theories yeah which we'll get into later but it's it, it is a creepy looking forest and you know how you had mentioned aoki gahara in the beginning and the trees in Aoki Gahara have weird look to them as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're it's different than Hoyabachu, but they're still like they're not normal looking trees. And I wonder if that, you know, is that because of something or? And this is just a rhetorical question, but is it because of something or is it, you know, the look of the trees causes you to think that something's going on or or what? I I don't know. I, I have a tendency to believe that it's just you see a strange looking tree or a lot of them and you begin to wonder why is this tree looking so weird and your your brain starts playing tricks on you. Yeah. And yeah. you're like, it's weird because this forest is alive and it's trying to take me in <laughs> and not yeah. let me out. Um, you know, I I think that's probably it, but there's most likely there's a good explanation for it yet there's not mm -hmm. you know that they don't have a real definitive explanation as to why the trees look this way right right and so whenever there's not a really good explanation other people come up with their own explanation theories run <laughs> rampant at that point that's right that's right so the dense tree coverage in Hoya uh, keeps light from really penetrating to the ground in much of the forest, which adds to the creep factor of the place. Um, and all the weirdly twisted branches, they all seem to be twisted in a clockwise direction. Now, that's weird. That is weird, right? I mean, so, you know, it, well, and it, it's funny because it makes me think, well, do they seem to be twisted in a clockwise direction? Or are they really twisted in a clockwise direction? Right. It would make you wonder, is that just a specific thing about these trees, that this is how they grow? Or were they acted upon by an outside force? Yeah. Was there like a, a weather them? event or something yeah. maybe that, that caused them to do that at some point in their life? And that's something that you and I can't really test the theory on or judge by the pictures being here in the U S not being able to go to Hoya Bachu. Um, but you know, it, it's weird. If that is the case, then that's a really weird happenstance. Yeah. So the forest also seems to always have a dense mist that surrounds the trees, which adds to the weird feeling you get as you walk through it. And due to this mist and the trees and the leaf litter on the ground, People have said there is an eerie absence of sound in yeah. the Hoya. And this is a lot like the Oz effect that we've talked about before when a paranormal event is just starting to happen. The witnesses claim that all the sound usually dies off and everything gets really quiet. Mm -hmm. And there have been theories put forth. Is this because, um, you know, one of Linda Godfrey's theories on the Oz effect is that at that point, you're being kind of covered up by an interdimensional wormhole or something, and you're seeing something that's taking place on the other side of the wormhole, or it's coming through a little bit, but you're still in the wormhole. So you're seeing some of our dimension, some of another dimension, 
and you're hearing what's on their dimension, which is absolute silence, or you're hearing that kind of in-between thing, Yeah, you know, like you don't hear their side or our side. And that is a, it's a very plausible explanation to me. So when you talk about Hoyabachu, if there's big patches where it's super quiet, I, could that be a sign of the Oz effect in one one sense or another happening in that forest? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I said that just like absolute. That that's exactly what it is. Yeah, wow. Well, you're I'm, you're in an in between between you're between two wormholes. Yep, and I I, I appreciate your enthusiasm <laughs> on that because. <laughs> yeah. It's done. All this skepticism, it's out. No skepticism yeah. at all. This is 100% no. what it is. Yeah, there is tin foil <laughs> under this baseball cap. So besides the spiraling trees, the other weird thing about the vegetation in the forest is what is known as the dead zone. Now, one section of the forest, and it's kind of a circular area. Um, some sources say that it's perfectly circular but just go look at google maps and you can tell that it's definitely not perfectly circular right um it's round it's roundish yeah um (laughs) so it's a roundish area and uh the area has where no vegetation can grow according to other sources except for the fact that grasses do grow there and some wildflowers so One source says it's a perfectly circular area in the center of this forest where absolutely no vegetation grows. But if you look at pictures, there are grass there. There's grass and some some points of the year there are, you know, some little wildflowers. Now, granted, there are no trees in this clearing. There are no bushes, you know. So, I mean, it's not that weird. It's just a clearing just kind of you know? is what it is you know so it, it depends on where you look um that that will tell you one thing or another um but they say the soil has been sampled in that area and it's unknown why they have lack of vegetation in in my opinion it could be because of lack of groundwater sources in that area or you know, there, there's a lot of different reasons why trees might not grow in a certain area. Yeah, and I mean, there's, there's, there's kind of an idea that you know a, a forest is is going to eventually take over. Um, you know, it it you know with with trees don't all grow in a group like this because somebody planted them that way. Right. You know, this is kind of how nature works, and so you figure, okay. You know, seeds fall from the trees, new trees grow. I mean, hell, I can grow trees in my gutters for crying out that, loud if I don't clean them out. Yeah. You know, why? You had a nice peach tree in there the last time That's I visited. I'm telling you. <laughs> you know, I, 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 you know, next year I'm going to try and grow like a, a, a vineyard in there. You know, I'm hey, going like, to have like grapes hanging over. It's going to look like a nice Tuscan village. You know, maybe start cool. making some wine out of my. This is gutter wine. Would you yeah. like to try it? <laughs> Don't worry, I put a little mummy dust in there. It's perfect. Yeah, it, it's fine. It's fine. Don't ask for <laughs> what part of the mummy, but <laughs> yeah. You know. So you know, most people would believe. Okay, the the forest would eventually take this clearing and just cover it up with trees. You know, trees mm-hmm. are going to eventually grow here, um, and they haven't. So there's bound to be a reason for that yeah. whether it's regular old science or it's something strangely paranormal uh we don't really know it's unusual uh, we don't know if it's paranormal um right but you know when they when they present it to you as no vegetation grows here it's not exactly yeah true. it's not 100% accurate on right. that so again, always check your sources, double check things before you believe, you know, just, I mean, just because it's on the internet does not mean it's true. Just what? because it's written. Yeah, I know. It's weird, right? Um, and just because what? it's written in a book doesn't mean that it's a hundred percent true. Why am I just hearing about this now? We've been doing this for know. three years. No. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I should have told you before, right? Now, 
This goes on to say that there are also biological effects that alter the plants and vegetation in other areas of the forest. And this is this is a weird thing that happens. Um, they say in certain parts, they show signs of dehydration, burns and stem and leaf necrosis. And there's little known as to what this cause is. So there is some weird stuff that happens to the vegetation in this forest in certain areas. But, you know, you would think that scientists, if they studied it, they could figure out why. Mm -hmm. But they still haven't figured out why you get these signs of burns and, and necrosis of the stem and leaf and stuff like that. That's not a it's not an easy um, conclusion to come to for science for some reason. Now, it says that the dead zone is where quite a bit of paranormal activity has actually been spotted. So this area that we're talking about, um, some have even said they think this area holds a portal that allows the UFOs and odd lights to actually come into the forest. This area is called the Poyana Rotunda. Now, it's about 2,000 square meters in size, um, or about a half an acre, and it's near the southwestern corner of the forest. Now, Matt and I were talking about this, and people say it's hard to find. But it's yeah. really not that hard to find, is it, Matt? No, it's not. There's a, a little road that goes in. It goes right through it. Yep. So I, follow the, Follow the yellow brick road and you get to the dead zone. <laughs> the only thing I could come up with is that maybe that that corner of the forest is not easily accessible. And yeah. where everybody naturally goes in to the forest, it's not near that corner where the clearing is. And so it's a it's a decent hike. Yeah. But of course, anybody that's going there to investigate they're they're going at night and everything's going to be hard to find any forest <laughs> is going to be difficult to find your way around at night yep so i don't know we haven't been there so i don't know if it's hard to find if i'm looking at it and every video i watched of every investigation they all talked about how hard it was to find but they didn't seem to have any trouble yeah, right. They, they went right to it. Yeah, this oh, is so here. hard to find. Oh, there it is. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people have said that when you step into this dead zone, that you are surrounded by forest and it makes you feel like you're eerily removed from the rest of Transylvania. So I can see that, you know, you go out to certain places, even in the city, like there in Nashville, there are certain places it's in the city. But if you go out into the trees enough, yeah. You kind of don't feel like you're in the city still. Right. Now, there was a person that started a true scientific investigation regarding this strange Hoyabachu forest. Now, it was a biologist named Alexandru Sift. He was attracted by the amazing stories that he would hear from the locals, and he decided to see firsthand what all the fuss was about. Now, in the 50s, he made several trips to the forest, taking numerous pictures, and he claimed that on these um, incursions into the forest, he would see strange shadows among the trees, and, and these shadows would follow him. But he never abandoned his project, and he, he took his photos, and then when he went to have them developed, this says his mind stuttered. So... <laughs> I, there were a I, lot of articles with broken English about this. Right, right. So basically, it confused him when he yeah. started looking at his photos. Um, shapes that were not supposed to be there were in the pictures. There were shadows that he didn't think he was capturing. And even the fact that some of the pictures on the camera were not in the same order that he had taken them in in the forest so now that's that's odd. That's really weird. When you go to develop your pictures and you know you took this one before this one, but it's three pictures after it. That's really weird. Now, they say that his research was a landmark for all future explorers of the Hoyabachu. 
which if he was one of the first ones to do serious investigations, I can see that. We all we do that with other places. The very first investigator, we look at their notes and, and their their studies to know what we're getting into to go, you know, through that area. Now, on August 18th, 1968, a military technician named Emil Barnea captured a famous photograph of a saucer flying over the Hoya Bachu. And then in the 70s, the area was a hotbed for UFO sightings and unexplained lights. And, and we'll post pictures of these in Patreon as well. Now, some have stated that the Hoya Bachu forest itself also shows signs of magnetic anomalies, fluctuations, and electromagnetic field weirdness and infrasound emissions. And we've talked about infrasound. If yeah. you get infrasound and some electromagnetic field fluctuations, it's going to cause you to see and hear things that aren't really there. Yep. And those infrasounds can cause weird like shadow things in your vision, you know, and electromagnetic fluctuations can mess with your brain. Um, the God helmet, I don't know if you've ever heard of the God helmet before, but it's helmet with electromagnets on there and it they fluctuate in a different pattern all along your brain mm -hmm. so it causes you to see and hear things that aren't really there so if the forest is doing that naturally that can be a big reason for this forest being weird i know and we talked about this when we did our episode on the hum mm -hmm. and you know how it can affect not just your brain but your eyes because i mean your eyes are essentially little sacks of fluid and yep. and yeah and sound works on that right someone i heard say i'll just jump in real quick and then give it back to you someone i heard say that your eyes actually are the only external part of your brain that in evolution they were part of your brain and then they got pushed out mm -hmm. so if you think about it that can be just as affected as your brain can by electromagnetism or uh you know weird sounds yeah, so you you get that um, that cavitation where the vibrations can actually cause like little bitty bubbles to occur in inside a sack of fluid. Well, hey, guess what? That's what your eyeballs are. Yep. And if something like that, even at a low level, is going on, you may not hear it, but you can feel it. And you can imagine if you get to a port, a, a port. If you get to a port, if you get to a port. <laughs> If you get to a part of the forest where that's going on and all of a sudden your vision is affected, then you're going to go, whoa, something weird's going on here. And, yep. it, and it may be something perfectly natural, but that's going to be that's going to be really disconcerting if, if you're standing in this supposedly haunted forest and all of a sudden you can't see well. Yep. And, you know, maybe this is just me spitballing here, but maybe the electromagnetic field fluctuations could have some effect on the vegetation in the forest, causing it not to grow in that one area because the electromagnetic field is messed up. So it's not going to allow the, the trees to grow as well. I don't know this for a fact, but just yeah. something I'd thought about as we were talking about it. That's right. I'm no botanist. No. So, Hoyabachu Forest is supposedly one of the best documented paranormal sites in the world, but science is not yet able to explain the source of the strange phenomena that are still waiting for answers. Now, speculations continue as to whether the forest is a portal to another world or to a parallel unknown universe. And that, that's interesting since we just did the multiverse episode. But, right. you know, it it's... They say it's the most documented haunted forest, you know, in, in the world. But I tell you what, Matt and I had a hell of a time <laughs> researching this episode. It, it, it may be, <clears throat> it may be well documented. It's just not documented well. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, I mean, or translated to English. Because uh, there may be a lot more out there that uh, we don't have access to because it's not in English. Yeah. What one of our favorite um, sources for information when we're doing a haunted location is TripAdvisor. 
Believe it or not. Uh, yeah, and you, you would be amazed at some of the stories people will share on their reviews of a place if it's supposed to be haunted, especially like hotels and bed and You just gave away our whatnot. secret, Matt. I know. I'm giving it away. Now all these other so, shows in parallel universes are going to take our... <laughs> Look, if they hadn't figured it out by now that you can find, I mean, you know, it's not hard, but it's it's fun because we you can really find some nuggets in there. Well, <laughs> Adam asked me, you know, hey, have you looked at TripAdvisor on this place? And I was like, uh, yeah, most of the reviews were not written in English and they were mm -hmm. translated and not well. Yeah. <laughs> Yep. So it's kind of like reading uh, reading the instructions from that uh, stereo receiver you ordered on Wish, you know. Yeah, right. So, so I was like, I don't think this is going to be of any help. But no. <laughs> but you know, it, it is a creepy. It is a creepy forest. I mean, like most of them are, uh, and it's in Romania for crying out loud, right? Right there in Transylvania, which is. In, in all actuality, much more cosmopolitan than anybody wants to believe from the U.S. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, it just causes you to think a certain way when you hear Transylvania, though. You know, you know, you know Americans have this idea that Transylvania is like some it, it still looks like these little little villages with people out washing clothes on a washboard yep. standing in the shadow of Dracula's castle. It's not really like that. No. Nope. <laughs> No, but, this weird but that's, gothic that's town. That's the idea you know? we get, you know. So yep. all this this forest in Transylvania must be terrifying. Okay, yep. maybe it is. Um, but but I mean, like we talked about Cluj Napoca at the beginning. It's a uh, hopping metropolis. It's just a city. You know, yeah. <laughs> the only way you tell you were somewhere else is because everything's in Romanian. You know, right, right. <laughs> okay, so as Adam said, there there have been a lot of stories. Uh, again. A lot of stories <laughs> mm -hmm. about people who go into the forest and never come back. Um, if there's a lot of these stories, I was able to find one, and it's right, a legend. Right. Okay, yep, it's a legend, and the the legend talks about a young girl who disappeared in the forest, only to reappear five years later, unable to remember where she had been. Okay. That's it. That's, and she that's had, the legend. I, I saw somewhere that she hadn't aged. You know, another telling of the legend said she hadn't aged. And was still wearing all. the same clothes she was wearing yep. when she disappeared. Yep. Um, but, you know, that, that lends to oh, time slip. You know, she yep. may feel like she's been gone for five minutes and she's been gone for five years. Mm -hmm. You know, a, along with the legend of the, of the shepherd and his sheep um, that were lost, that were you know, essentially gave the forest its its name. But that's not all. I mean, you know, as Adam mentioned, the visitors to the forest report these intense feelings of anxiety. And like Adam mentioned at the top of the show, this feeling of being watched. It's also said, as he mentioned, people come down with these physical problems, the, the rash. The rash is probably one of the most common that you find when you're researching this. Um, you know, people will develop this strange rash the minute they walk in, which either says, oh, there's something weird going on or, oh, everybody's allergic to something that's growing in the forest. Yeah. But fevers, headaches, burns, and extreme thirst have also been reported by visitors to uh, the Hoya. Now, there are people who have evil and dark thoughts in their minds. And these are the people, according to legend, that the forest will be the most active for. Hmm. Now, they're they're not the only ones, but they tend to think that the forest will take that and cause that evil to manifest back to you, almost as so if you and I are screwed. Then if we go. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I don't I don't know about me. You, 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 I may not want to go with you, but yeah, valid point. <laughs> but it's almost this idea that the the forest tries to punish bad people that enter, enter, mm -hmm. enter the trees. You know that everything is geared towards, you know, taking, you know, taking what evil lies within you, and reflecting it back to you. 
Um, but you know, and Adam mentioned the weird shaped trees that, that, that give the, the, you know, the idea that there is something very odd or paranormal going on in there. Um, now, as far as the trees go, so the trees are kind of twisted. They do look odd. They they kind of bend inward as you're going into the into the forest. So it it would give an appearance that it's reaching for you. Um, and like we said, there without a scientific explanation, people have come up with their own. But one of the ideas is that it's some type of radiation that has caused the malformation of these trees. Decent. Where does that radiation come from? So there's no real natural source of radiation within the forest, and it's not like somebody's buried a bunch of plutonium um, in, in the forest. So the that idea was that, can you guess, Adam, where this radiation would come from? I can probably guess. Take We've a, talked about take it. A, take a stab at it. We, well, we've talked about it before. Yeah. So I, I'm thinking Chernobyl. Not a bad guess, um, but not not on the list. Oh. <laughs> but oh. I like but I like your thought process there. Um, UFOs. Ah, the, yep. the UFOs visiting the forest, landing and then taking off again. Have like in Rendlesham. Yeah, have left, you know, this this radiation mark on the forest. And over time, it has caused the trees to become, you know, misshapen. Um, and that's the best one anybody could come up with. <laughs> yeah. Like, okay, we'll roll with it. Um, you know, the UFO story thing, that's another one. It, it's. There's just not a ton of documented cases of UFO sightings, even though regardless of what article you read will tell you that the, you know, the uh, Hoya Bachu is a hotbed for UFO activity, especially in the late 60s, early 70s. Mm -hmm. um, post pictures. But there's just there's just not a lot of accounts of people seeing UFOs. Um but there, but there is, there is one, and we're going to get into it here in just a few minutes. Um, but Adam mentioned the strange photographs. People that have taken photographs inside the forest have gotten some really strange images. Um, unseen when the pictures are taken, shadowy figures that seem to be lurking behind the trees when the photos are examined later. Even full-on apparitions of people in traditional historical Romanian clothing uh, have been have been seen and and partially captured on photos. Faces are probably the most common thing captured, where it, it appears that a face is somehow in the trees, looking back at you. Something that you would not have seen when you were actually taking the photograph. But when you go right. back and you look and you say, "This is a face," which it could be a face or it could be, you know, the, the pareidolia where you're, mm -hmm. you're picking up on a pattern and you're finding a face. I, I, I did this with my daughter just the other night. You, you're shown a picture and it's like, find the faces and you're like, oh, well, here's one and here's one and here's one and here's one. And they're not faces that are drawn in the the artist had taken the shape of in this case, it was like a stream with some rocks and some trees. And you could see the way the artist had shaped the, the, the lines of the landscape to make a face here, mm -hmm. to make a face there. But your brain wants to pick up on that. And, and all it takes is a couple little uh, subtle things that draws your eye to it and makes you go, oh, that's the shape of a face, you know? Yeah. You basically just need three little like circular areas, two eyes and a mouth, and you can you immediately go, oh, that's a face. Every time I look at an outlet, it's a little face. Yeah, exactly. You know, so I mean that the human brain wants to do that, and and so it's really difficult to tell when you look at any of these photographs. Is am I seeing a formed face, or am I just seeing what my mind is picking up on and says it's a face? Now, 
the Romanians have have known about the the energy and the strange happenings in the forest for a very long time, and they do avoid it because it's considered to be an evil place where these strange things happen. And pretty well, you know, the Romanian people have have stories that say once you walk in there, you're never going to emerge the same. Um, you know, they, they really can play on your fears here. People say that you can hear rustling that seems like it comes from another world where all the human fears that lie in the subconscious begin to appear uh, in front of you. Well, that sounds pretty terrifying. Sounds like a tagline yeah, for a movie, too. Um, but, you know, the locals have noticed, you know, that when you go into the woods to either chop wood or you know, clean away brush or pick blueberries or flowers, something strange always tends to happen. And, you know, when you come out, you know, you've got a rash or a scratch or you, you feel sick or something is just off. And, you know, according to legend, you, you will never be the same once you go in the forest. That's just... It's creepy, man. Yeah. Now, they say that once you step into the forest, the minute you go in, that inexplicable nausea, anxiety, headaches, the burns, they just, they automatically begin. But, you know, Adam and I have watched a lot of videos of people walking straight into this thing, and nobody's talking about any of those. And, right. I, you know, anxiety and headaches and all of those kind of things can be brought about by your, your own personal, you know, fear and the idea that something is going to terrify you can be that much worse than anything that would actually scare you. Mm -hmm. But, you know, with this forest, the idea that at one time the, the devil lived there is, is part of the legend. Now, uh, I don't want to live anywhere. The devil lived. I, no, thanks. Now, um, now, Adam mentioned that uh, uh, Alexand Alexandru Sift, who was a biologist who, who studied the phenomena that were supposedly happening in the woods, and he started taking regular trips, and he noticed that the shadows always seemed to be there and try to follow him. Now, he continued his research and even managed to photograph the shadows. Um, but when he, as Adam said, you know, he notices things like his pictures being out of order and things like that. Um, but he said these things were never able to be noticed by human eyes. They were always only captured on photographs, um, which seems a little suspect to me. Yeah. <laughs> I don't yeah. know why. But, you know, not, none of this stuff is really seeming like, oh, this is all this scary because it's all like, Oh, this is terrifying. It's horrifying. You, you can't see it. Yeah. You just trust me. Yeah. Take a picture of it. And when you go home and you develop the picture, it's going to scare the bejesus out of you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and then that's something we can talk about uh, a little bit later, too, uh, that I, I want to get into about this forest. Uh, I won't interrupt your stories, but we'll uh, come back to that. Interrupt away, my friend. But well, <laughs> <laughs> I'll go ahead. So we, we I, I promised I would come back to this UFO thing. And, you know, even though we don't have a lot of stories, we, we do have we do have one really good one. And so, I mean, it, it haunted or not, you know, people have reported the lights and the UFOs uh, in the area above and around the clearing. Now, in 1968, military technician Emil Barnea photographed what he described as a UFO. Now, the photograph shows a round object tilted at an angle uh, hovering above, above the tree line. Now, what makes Barnea's story so compelling is that he stood nothing to gain by reporting the photo. In fact, he stood to lose everything. The, com right, the communist right. government equated a belief in the paranormal with madness and, and state sabotage. 
And Barnea lost his job in a country which has no support for people who have been fired. So, you know, for him to even come out and say, hey, I took these pictures and I think it's a UFO, he was really putting everything on the line. Yeah, I mean, they technically could have killed him. Yeah. I mean, they could have they could have at least imprisoned him, you know, for for making these type of claims. True or not. Mm -hmm. Now. On this trip, Barnea was accompanied by his girlfriend, Zamfira Matea, and two other family friends that didn't want to reveal their names. Now, around one o'clock in the afternoon, he was looking for some wood to build a fire, and he was suddenly called by his friends. That was the time when Barnea saw what appeared to be a UFO that was flying with very little gear above the forest, and it wasn't making any noise. Now, the object started to suddenly shine, um, and it seemed to be making like a a tactical movement in the air. But without warning, the object accelerated into the sky at at an angled direction that was not, there, there wasn't an aircraft at the time that would do such a thing. Right. Now, he followed it through the viewfinder of his camera, and he managed to take three separate photographs. Now, afterwards, Barnea contacted Florin, Georgita, and Ion Hobana. They were the most famous Romanian UFO scientists, and they confirmed the authenticity of the pictures, just that the pictures were real and they hadn't been doctored. Now, Hobana also explained that in Romania at the time, there was no possibility of selling these photos and that their publication implied by no means any kind of financial benefit to the author. Right. And so it was impossible to put forth this idea that Barnea had perpetrated a hoax in, in hopes of getting some money out of it. Yeah. Now, after it the, just, it doesn't fit. Right. Like you said, it, there's no way that that would have been his game plan. Yeah. It, it would have been far too dangerous to try this. Yeah. And there was no, there was no structure for him to say, Hey, you want to see these photos? This is how much you want to put these photos in your magazine. It's going to cost you there. They couldn't do that. The, right. The, the communist government didn't have a structure that would even allow you to do that. Mm-hmm. Okay. They were, you know, you put out the photos, they're property of the state. Anybody can have them, you know, that yep. has the right license to do so. So there wasn't any, you know, Hey, I got it and you want it. How much is it worth to you? No, there was none of that. Right. So why do it at all? He's putting himself at risk. And, you know, he's not going to get anything. Everything he's going to yeah. get sucks. So, you right. know, imprisoned, lose your job, whatever. Yeah, none of that's great. You know, so why don't I just keep my mouth shut? Now, yep, I probably would have. Now, Hubana was able to speculate some additional details based on his interview with the witnesses and his examination of the photos. Now, he said that it, it, it had to have flown in a straight line towards the northeast Now, after having changed directions towards the southwest, it seemed to go down slowly towards the ground. Now, based on the photo, he calculated the altitude of being about 600 meters, and the angle relative to the horizon was 85 degrees. Now, that's a pretty, that's That's a a, a steep angle. You know, I mean, it's almost perpendicular to the horizon. You know, Mm -hmm. we don't really have, you know, except for a rocket. We don't have anything that travels that way. The, you know, the, uh, the object remained fixed, um, along its flight path, meaning it was, it was somehow, it, it didn't, it it didn't respond to gravity like a normal aircraft would. It was able to change constantly its flight and flight path. And it seemed to be made of metal because it, it had this shine to it and it didn't it didn't match any known human made device, you know, aircraft or, or others. And he said, based on the photograph, the diameter must have been more than 30 meters. So, hmm. I mean, you know, how he got all that from three photos, I don't know. But, uh, but context clues, I guess. I, yeah. I mean, I see the angles and things like that. But either way, you know, this is what he deducted by talking to the witnesses about what they saw 
and and then applying that to the photographs, this is what he was able to determine. Um, you know, speculation, yes, but I mean, you know, again, you know, the, the you can look at the photos and it, it it's not what you it, it I promise you it's not what you think. I mean, you're you're not gonna look at what traditionally would be considered a flying saucer. Right. It, it's maybe more like a flying bagel. Um yeah. it's very well, it's very we'll round, try to get it's those very pictures rounded. In. Um yeah. you know, it, it almost it, it does. It looks like a bagel, except it doesn't have a hole in the middle. Right. Um, Check your uh, Patreon page uh, shortly after this drops, and we'll try to put some pictures in there. But it certainly doesn't appear to have any kind of edges, any kind of engines, no protrusions, you know, anything like that. Um, and again, you know, the, the photos were considered to be authentic. And, you know, at the time, you know, they were the the absolute best UFO photos taken in Romania. Yeah. But, you know... When you look at the photos and you and you and you consider Barnea's situation, it really makes you think. Okay, even though this may not have been what we would want to consider to be a UFO, it, it was definitely an unidentified flying object. Barnea couldn't identify it. Experts couldn't mm-hmm. identify it. Um, and, and with everything he stood to lose and the ability to gain absolutely zero, you you've You've got to believe that at least in his heart and mind, Barnea is telling the truth. This is what we saw. This is what I took pictures of. It may or may not be something from outer space or another dimension, but it was definitely something that he had never seen before and nobody else could identify. Right. Um, so that's why I tend to believe his, his account, uh, yeah, for the too. exact reasons that you're saying it. It's like we've talked about other, like even just military professionals in in the United States, they used to have a lot to lose by saying it. So if they're willing to come out and say it, I'm willing to believe it. Yeah. Now, there are a couple of guys um, that help promote the forest in Romania in an effort to conserve it, bring some attention to it, and hopefully bring some tourists and travel to the area. And they're Alex Serdican and Marius Lazen, and they run this organization uh, to promote the uh, Hoya Bachu Forest. Now, they organize tours, and and they are guides through the forest. And, you know, they've had a few odd things happen to them, too. Now, Alex says he likes to maintain a distance from a lot of the full-on myths, like the little girl that wandered out of the forest after being lost for five years. He kind of shies away from those things. It's understandable. And it turns out he's not a big fan of actually sleeping in the forest. He says the first time he camped overnight, uh, he was in, inside a tent, and they kept being woken up by a very loud hoof noise, like a horse or oh, you know, a, a large hoofed animal was approaching. But yet, when they looked outside, there was nothing there, and the noise went away. Only it's a satyr. Only <laughs> it's a satyr. <laughs> <laughs> Might as well be. Um, but you know they would they would look outside. Noise would stop. They they go back in. Noise would come back, and they never could identify it. So the next time, Alex says he slept in a hammock so he could get whatever you know get closer to whatever was making the sound. But th- sure. that visit was cut short when he, uh, when a bat smashed into his face. Now, Oh geez. If I'm, if look, if I'm camping in any forest haunted or not, if a bat smashes into my face, I'm done. I'm going home. Yep. I'm out. Yep. <laughs> Me too. I was like, yeah, I'm done. it's a bad day. I'm gone. I'm, I'm going, I'm going home. I need a bed. Yeah, I I don't want anything smashing into me in a forest. I don't care. <laughs> now, Alex and Marius worked with filmmakers and actually made a, a, a travel documentary on the Hoya Bachu called The Hoya Bachu Forest, Truth or Legend. And this apparently ran and became very popular in Japan uh, because Alex and Marius are like very well known in Japan. That's cool. I don't know why I never it never made it over here, I don't guess. But you can you can actually go and watch it and it and it and it is interesting. 
Um, but it, and it goes into some of the legend of, of the forest. And, um, but it, again, you know, we're, we're talking about a really creepy looking forest, uh, that has just a lot of legends, um, and a lot of, uh, I don't know, just, just stories about it. No, yeah. You know, and no real experiences, just a whole lot of stories. And that's what I uh, wanted to talk about that I wasn't going to interrupt you for. Um, it's like the the forest is, you know, it's it's got this legendary status. And so many people have heard about it and they have this expectation of the Hoya Bachu and you've had TV shows um, like old Mr. Bagels that went and did a, you know, his group went out there and did something in the forest. And it just seems to me like it's a creepy forest that has some legends from way back. And there may be some weird things that happen there. It may be, you know, the electromagnetic fluctuations, the infrasound, that there are things there that cause you to feel weird, mm -hmm. to to have weird experiences. And, you know, the, like you were talking about the rash. Okay, the rash, that could be explained medically, scientifically, that there is something in there that makes human skin break out. I don't know. But what... <sighs> They said it's the most well-documented forest, haunted, haunted forest. I, from our research, I feel like it, it, there's a lot of hype about this yeah. forest that doesn't really seem to play out. It's documented you know? hype. Yeah, it's a lot of legends. A lot of so-and-so said so-and-so had this happen to their friend's daughter. And it's like, okay, well names you know can i get any names can we verify any of these sources can can you give me a date on anything because even who you know the forest was named after this shepherd yeah well it's just shepherd's forest there's no name of the actual guy right <laughs> there's no it happened in this year or anything yeah there's there's no way to verify anything that we have talked about there's some dates from you know, those couple of guys that had the pictures, which we'll show you the pictures, but, you know, that seems to be the most well-documented part of anything that's happened there. Yeah. And I'm, I, I had high, you know, high expectations and high hopes for the stories that would come out of the Hoya Bachu, but... I, I hate to say it, but I was kind of let down. I know. Honestly. I know. And there's a lot of they says about the forest yeah. like like they say um that the the windshield of cars you know get pelted with stones even though there's no one around to throw them and mm -hmm. and you know they say that automobiles have a tendency to break down and repairmen can't figure out what happened you know what's right. going on or um you know they say that there are actual strange unidentified animals that dwell in the forest that will appear and disappear. Again, there's, there's no real, there, there's no real verified cases of anyone making those claims, you know, that, that Joe Schmo Romanian says that he was in the forest in September of 1994 and saw X, Y, and Z that if it's out there, it's, it's in Romania and yeah. it's, it's not, it, it, it's not in a format that's easily accessed. Right. Um, right. And I mean, trust me, we, we dug pretty deep on this, trying to find just anything that, and that would make Matt us go. And are not difficult to please in that that's sense. That's true. That's true. we we'll, we can we can make a mountain out of molehills real fast. <laughs> yeah, you give us just some stuff. I mean, some verifiable anything, you know, then we're happy and and you know it makes us feel like we've completed 
one round of an investigation of this area or this building or this whatever. But I just, I feel kind of let down by it and that I need to continue looking. Yeah. You know, I, I need to keep digging and see if I can find something that can be translated into English that I can read yeah. and get some verifiable anything from. Yeah. So this is where you guys come in. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if if uh, the Hoya bought you, if it interests you, if the idea of a haunted forest in Romania, you know, tickles your fancy. And, and you start digging, and you can find something that Adam and I missed. Let us know. I mean, maybe yeah. we've got some listeners that have actually traveled there or have been, you know, in that region and and have heard personal accounts that maybe aren't published. We'd, we'd love to hear them because, as Adam and said, we, will we, do a we were follow up. Yeah, we were we were kind of bummed at what we were able to dig up. On, on the mm -hmm. Hoya Bachu, because again, it, it was hyped as being, you know, the, the Romanian Bermuda Triangle. And, yep. there, you know, we just weren't able to dig up enough that made us go, yeah, this place is really weird. We're thinking, right. yeah, this is kind of a scary forest, but I mean, yeah. there, there, are, there are stories of, you know, 60 people that were found in that clearing that were trying to do some ceremony that was going to allow them to travel through time. We don't know any names, who saw them, when it particularly happened. Um, there is also an urban legend of the, in the 1950s that um, included the government doing experiments by giving people a map and a compass and offering them, you know, a, a large sum of money if they could make it from one end of the forest to the other in 48 hours and they were all given a diary to keep, and they all found these bodies of people in the forest in the diaries where they had kept notes that indicated they were going insane, that somehow the yeah. forest drove them yeah. insane. Again, it's an urban legend. Yeah, you where know? are the diaries? Right. And you know, so so it, it's really hard to say, and, you know, it does sound like this is just one of these places that has grown story after story after story after story. And they just kind of take a life of their own. And, you know, those stories are great. Don't get us wrong. You know, we love sharing those kind of things, but we're just not finding anything that would make us say, yeah, we believe that there's something much more going on in that forest. Yep. So that brings us to the part, not only like Matt said, if you have other information that we didn't cover that might make us believe, send that to us, you know, you can email or, or, uh, get on the website and drop us a note from the website. But also, tell us what you guys think. Do you think the Hoya Bachu Forest it is really a, a strange forest with a lot of things happening? And, you know, Matt and I just couldn't, are, we're wrong. We couldn't, we couldn't find it. Right. Um, you know, or do you think it, it's like we said, a bunch of legends that have turned this creepy ass forest into something more than it is? Yeah. Uh, let us know. You know, we got a uh, voicemail you can call or you can text that number. You can email us or, you know, Facebook us or whatever. Yeah. And you can find us on Facebook, uh, Twitter, and Instagram. Uh, all you have to do is search Graveyard Tales. And while you're doing that, you can visit our website. It's graveyardpodcast.com. There you can find links to purchase Graveyard Tales merchandise. You can listen to the show and you come up and you can become a patron and, uh, you know, for our $10 patrons, you get to see the video of Adam and I trying to pronounce all these Roma Romanian names. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but please go rate and review us on iTunes. It helps us come up the charts and it brings more people into the graveyard. So mm -hmm. until next time, we'll save you a seat in the graveyard. See you soon. You guys rule from Miami, Florida. Love you. Hey, guys. I just wanted to thank you so much on the clarification. Thought Mongolian death worm is what you got from undercooked hibachi. Appreciate the cast. Love you guys.